Portions of the south and southeast went through a very stormy Friday. We've had reports of several tornadoes that have done some pretty major damage. Yeah. Kim will be talking about that in just a moment, and we had some flooding to talk about too. A lot going on. Good evening. Welcome to WeatherScope. I'm Jeff Morrow. And I'm Kim Perez. We'll have our nightly feature El Nino Focus a bit later in the show, but we begin with the storms in the southeast. This is the aftermath from a tornado that touched down in Covington, Louisiana, just before 2 p.m. today. 25 people were injured and 80% of downtown buildings were heavily damaged. The tornado has been given a preliminary Vegeta classification of F2, but a formal sur survey will be held Saturday morning. One F1 tornado touched down early this morning in Lafayette, Louisiana. At least 20 homes and businesses were damaged. One injury was reported. The twister packing winds between 80 and 100 miles per hour took down trees and tore up rooftops. Officials estimate that the tornado path was about three miles long and 200 yards wide. Now you may be asking, you know, what is a Fujita scale? Well, it's just a classification. It's how National Weather Service people, when they go out and examine the area that was hit by a tornado, it's how they decide what kind of damage was it. They look at the damage and decide what kind of a tornado it was. By looking at the damage, you can tell if it was a strong tornado or a weak one. And the scale goes from zero to an F5. Now, these tornadoes were on the lower end of the scale, but for sure, still producing some damage. Now, look at the watches still in effect tonight. Not tornado watches, but severe thunderstorm watches in effect here. We have a couple of things coming together. One, we have some dry air coming in behind our system. We have moisture ahead of it. And you're looking at some of the thunderstorm tops here, looking at the very white clouds here. And ahead of our front, we've had some pretty juicy air too. So we have our cold front coming into an area that's unstable, especially along the Gulf Coast states where we did see our tornadic activity today. And then to the north here where our warm front is, it was what we call wedged, actually. Uh, kind of a cool day today, temperatures north of the front, uh, on the cool side, 40s and 50s, south of the front, 70s and 80s. So quite a difference here if you're on either side of this front. But either way, you got rain today. And with those dew points as high as they are, 60s and even upper 60s, even some areas had 70s earlier today, that we're seeing the thunderstorms develop and continue along this area, actually around Mobile getting hit hard. And even around Macon, look at this, another line of thunderstorms moving through the area. And then the rain continues now into the mid-Atlantic states. So Richmond, D.C., Norfolk, not out of the question, you could see some severe weather tonight, plus some heavy rains. We've had already Doppler estimates of three to four inches with some of these lines of storms. Now, even into the Ohio Valley, 
We do see some wet weather in the northeast, mainly rain at this point, but some of the areas here in the higher elevations could be changing over to snow. But for D.C., New York, Boston, it will be rain. But farther inland around Albany, Burlington, we're looking at temperatures uh, dropping and some snowfall. Here's your forecast. Now let's talk about some winter weather in the upper Midwest, Jeff. All right, Kim, and indeed, we do have a bit of a clipper moving through that part of the world. Some light snow, about three inches worth, fell around the Fargo area, but it was enough to slow folks down. That snow now trying to pull its way through Minneapolis and Duluth slowly, and we have had reports of up to a half a foot of snow already in central Minnesota. So, uh, yeah, this is a slow mover, not a typical clipper system moving through the upper Midwest. Clipper usually indicating that these systems are moving quickly. Uh, this one, a little bit more taking its time, but it does have limited moisture to work with, so anything more than a half a foot of snow would be, again, rather unusual, and most areas have picked up one to three inches. As I mentioned, Fargo, a little over three inches, pretty much over with there. Minneapolis has picked up a couple of inches. Uh, looks like some snow flying around the Duluth area as well. There's our clipper, graphically represented, moving its way toward the east. Some fog to be dealt with if you're traveling around Omaha down to Kansas City or St. Joseph. And we have another system which is pulling out of the Rockies down here into the central plains. There are a few rain showers developing here ahead of that little piece of energy, if you will. That will eventually scoot to the southeast and develop a storm, which we'll talk about in the forecast in just a moment. Meanwhile, as we head out west, just a little band of... I guess along a warm front, a little band of showers which moved inland, nothing really too terribly heavy. If you're driving north along Interstate 5, up through the Sacramento Valley and on up over Sexton Summit, you'll probably run into a little bit of rain, but definitely nothing that's going to slow you down too much. Current temperature readings, 41 in Seattle, 41 in Reno, 61 in Phoenix, and 64 is coming in at San Diego and L.A. Let's talk about El Nino now, and with our El Nino focus, here's Kim. Thanks, Jeff. Well, some experts say this year's El Nino is responsible for stronger eastern Pacific hurricane activity. Others have a different view. Janetta Jones takes a look at both sides of the coin in tonight's El Nino Focus. Hurricane Pauline hit the Mexican coastline near Acapulco on October 8th. Did this year's strong El Nino contribute to the hurricane's strength? There are opposing views. With the Unusually warm waters off the coast of Mexico this season, uh, kind of an offshoot of El Nino. Uh, we believe that this probably intensified Pauline. But the question has to do is, did the El Nino cause these water temperatures to be higher than the ordinary would be at the latitude where Pauline formed? We know the El Nino causes above normal water temperatures at the equator and maybe five to ten degrees above the equator. Another